Alrighty, it's time to lay some cable. Alright, so we're going to be running two main types of circuit in our van. The first one being 12 volts DC and the second one being 240 volts AC. 12 volts DC is what our house batteries will provide. 240 volts AC is what the standard household appliances use in Australia. So the majority of our system is going to be 12 volts DC and there's two reasons for that. The first one is just more efficient. Because we're already at 12 volts with what our batteries are putting out, we can just use that directly. As soon as we start running 240, we've got to convert it up using our inverter. We're going to lose some efficiencies there because it's just not 100% efficient. We're also running the inverter, so that uses some power as well. And the second reason is with the 12 volt circuits, I can run that and wire that all up myself. With 240, I need a licensed electrician to come in and wire up the appliances. So I've actually spoken to my mate who's a Sparky and the van certifier who has a Sparky that works for him. He's okay for me to run the cables in the van as long as I've got photos and videos and then just leave the final wiring up to him for that. We've got a whole bunch of cable here. I'm gonna start with the 240 side of things because that's just a bit simpler in the setup. So for our 240, we're basically gonna be running three power points, one up near the kitchen, one near the seat, and then one in the back at the garage. Now after talking to the Sparky, I'm gonna be running two and a half mil twin and earth for the power points. And then we're also running a shore plug, so that's gonna let us plug in to the grid and charge if we ever need that. And for that, I'm running a six mil twin and earth. Now with the 12 volt system, we're gonna be running everything else. So our lights, fans, fridge, all that sort of thing. So cable size is really important for this. And there's gonna be two main factors that play into that. The first one being how many amps the appliance is gonna draw. And the second is how long the cable run is. So the longer the cable run, the greater the voltage is gonna drop because the wire has resistance in it. I'm gonna to jump to the computer now and just run through the different circuits we have and where they're running to, because that's just gonna be a little bit simpler to show. So the first thing I did was get all of my appliances and break them down into different circuits. I've probably gone a little bit overboard with the amount of circuits that I have here, but there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, I kind of wanted everything on its own circuit for fault finding reasons. So you can imagine if I ran, you know, all my lights and fan and toilet fan and everything on one circuit and then the toilet fan gets some water in it shorts out so it's going to be a bit of a challenge to work out which of those appliances has the fault and then I probably can't use those other appliances until I sort that fault out as well so I probably you know, wouldn't be able to use the lights if they're on the same circuit but if the toilet fan is on its own circuit and it shorts out it's going to be pretty obvious that that's where the fault is I can fix that and I can also use the lights and other things like that while I fix the fault. The next reason is it keeps the amperage down in each of my circuits, which means I can run smaller cables, which are cheaper, and they're also more flexible and easier to run. And the final reason is sometimes it was just easier to run the circuit where I needed to by putting it on its own circuit. So you can see here, I've got my front and rear down lights on their own circuits. Realistically, that could probably go together, but I wanted to run the switch for the front ones near the front door and the switch for the rear ones near the bed so I can just switch the rear down lights off from bed without stumbling back to bed in the dark. So it was just easier to put them on their own circuit from the fuse block to where I needed to switch them. Once I had all my circuits worked out, the next thing I did was work out the max amperage for each of those. So what I wanted to do was just buy one roll of wire and use that for all my 12 volt circuits. It just meant it was easier. I could buy, you know, 100 meters of cable in bulk and didn't have to buy all these individual pieces of wire and work out what size cable for which circuit. So what I did was just listed that out and then I looked for what the maximum was. So we're sitting up around eight there, eight amps. And then I just assumed a max amperage of 10 amps for all my circuits. So nothing's gonna exceed 10 amps. So if I just say every circuit is gonna have up to 10 amps, then that covers that off. Then the next thing I did was just put a bit of a factor of safety on there. So if it's a 10 amp circuit, although nothing's really getting up that close, I just put 150% load on that. So I wanted every circuit to be able to carry up to 150% of the rating that I'd set, which was 15 amps. From that, I just looked for a cable that would carry at least 15 amps. 
and the cable that I did opt for, the manufacturer specified it could carry up to 22 amps. So this method is probably a little bit conservative in terms of how many amps I'm allowing for in the circuit, but it doesn't consider the length of the circuit that I'm running for each of the individual circuits. So I used another method as a bit of a sanity check for the cable sizing. So if we scroll down here, this is a chart that's made by Blue Sea Systems. So they make a lot of fuses and things like that that we're going to be using in our solar install. So this chart shows your amps along here for the circuit. And then you've got critical and non-critical uh, circuit types. So for me, something critical would be like my fridge and something non-critical would be lights where you can probably allow for a bit more drop without any sort of ramifications. And then as you go down the chart, it has the length of the circuit. And then in here is all your cable sizing. So I'll just do an example. So for the fridge, it's going to have a max draw of four and a half amps. I think the cable will be about five meters or so from the block to the fridge itself. So five amp draw, it's going to be a critical circuit and it's going to run about five meters. So we're probably sitting in that 15, 16 gauge cable territory. There's one other thing I'll mention down here, and that was just working out the cable sizing from my Victron Lynx distributor, which is what I'm going to use as a bus bar to the actual 12 volt fuse block. So for that, I just tallied up all of the amps here, which came out as 44 amps, put a 50% increase on that. So 150% of the total as a bit of a factor of safety. And that's come out as 65 amps. And from the Victron links to the fuse block, it's probably going to be about a meter. So scrolling down here, 65 amps, let's say 70 amps. It's going to be a critical circuit, zero to 1.8 meters. It's probably about a meter across there to the 70 amps. So six AWG or six gauge cable will be fine for that. Here I've just prepared a little bit of a schematic. It's very simplistic but it's just showing where each of my circuits goes and I can use that as I'm running the cables and just check off each of the circuits to make sure I've run the cable where I need to run it. So what we've got is this twin core wire. So it's got a positive and a negative in there. Each one is individually sheathed and then it's got a sheath over the whole thing. So what we can do is just run this wire to each appliance, to each light. We don't have to run two separate wires. And the wire that we're using is 15 gauge, also called 15 AWG or 15 BNS. It's also referred to as four mil by the manufacturer and I've got a hundred meter roll of that. So possibly overkill. The manufacturer has rated this one for 22 amps. So way above what we need. And for most of the appliances, yeah, it's going to be heaps more than needed, but it means we can just run the single cable type everywhere. All that cabling I'm going to run in the walls of the van before we clad it and before we run the second layer of insulation over the top of it. I have started marking out where we're going to put some of these through. We're going to try and use some of the holes that we can already. As you can see, it's starting to get a bit chaotic already. But yeah, trying to use what holes we can, drill some extra holes in. Another cable we're running as well is the solar. So this is the 10 gauge solar coming in from the roof. That's going to run down to where all our solar equipment will be. I'm then also going to run a line of 10 gauge to the back of the van. I'm going to put an Anderson plug in there and we're going to have with our DC DC charger another port for a portable solar panel. If we're ever parked in the shade or anything like that and we need it, we can run a cable out and have a panel out in the sun. All right, we'll chuck the speedies on and then we're gonna drill some holes in the van. So yesterday we finished working out where a lot of our cabling needs to go. Although we know where a lot of our appliances go, there's some extra thought in there as well with where we've got to run switches. So for our lights and things, we're running cables to the roof, but we've got a switching point. Same thing for some of our things like our water pump as well. While we know where it's going, we've got to run a switch point and run extra cable. So we just need to allow for that. We also finished drilling holes for where cables are going to run, where we're running 12 volt and putting cables through the wall. 
I've put some 25 mil corrugated conduit in there and superplex that in place just to stop the wire rubbing on the bare metal. For the rest of the 12 volt against the insulation, I'm not gonna put that in conduit, but for the 240 volt stuff, everything will need to be in conduit. To feed the wire through the conduit, we pulled some fencing wire through the conduit. Now we're just tying up the wire to the cable we need to pull through. Because the cable's so flexible, you can't push it through the conduit. All right, so a few of our cables have been run now, and I thought I'd walk through some of those to try and explain it a little bit. So basically, this is gonna be our solar hub. So the bed will finish here. We're gonna have our seat under that is where the batteries and a lot of our solar stuff's gonna be sitting. And then on the wheel well is where our inverter is going to be sitting. I'm going to build a little box over that. So I'll start with some of this 240. So we've got uh, this will run in conduit. And that this one here runs back through there to the back. We're going to put a double power point in there. That's mainly for charging our mountain bike batteries and um, Ryobi batteries or whatever else we've got in the garage space. Then we've got a 240 cable as well that runs up and over here and runs down the side and that's where we're going to put our shore plug as well. But I probably could have put it on the other side next to the gas box and that would have been a whole heap easier. The gas fitter said that would be all right, but I kind of just wanted it away from the gas box. Then we've got another 240 line that runs up and over here, across here. And then I've just got a whole bunch of extra cable there. And once we frame it up, that is going to run down. I'm going to put a power point on the kitchen bench. Coming in from the roof here, we've got our solar uh, input cables. So that's running down through there and into here, and that's gonna be where our isolator switch for the panels and the solar charge control is gonna be. We're gonna run another set of those uh, 10 AWG cables down to the back into an Anderson plug for a portable panel. And then the rest of what's going on so far is the start of our 12 volt. So everything's gonna be running off two of these um, fuse blocks. So they're 12 way fuse blocks. So I'll run through some of the circuits that we've got just to give you a bit of an understanding. So these ones here are our light circuits. So we've got our alley lights, which were the lights that the police van had fitted. So we're gonna reuse those. I've got individual cables for those because I wanna be able to switch them on and off individually. And they also do have bulbs in them at the moment that are 50 watts. So it's a little bit higher uh, wattage. So we'll follow one of these up, but basically it just runs up. So that's the right hand alley light and that's the left hand one. So that's gonna be our outdoor lighting. So that basically runs up. We've got an extra bit of cable looped here. And that's gonna be where our switches are for the lights. That then runs along here, down to here and we've labeled all of the cables so we know what they are. So that light is just on the other side of that. And then the other one runs down and over here. And the other light is sitting just there. So the other one is our um, down lights. So we have the front four down lights on a single switch at the entrance when you come in. So they come in from, so they come in from here. So that will be the connection to a switch here. That runs up and then this cable runs along here. So that'll be our first down light there. I've just left a bit of cable in there. So we'll just connect that up and then we'll continue wiring along. Runs along here to our second down light. So when we fit those, we'll just be able to cut them and wire them in. Then it runs along. We're gonna have a down light over the stove here and then across and through and over here and we'll have a down light over the sink as well. So that'll all come on and off with one switch. And then we're gonna put the two down lights over the bed on a separate switch that we can turn on and off from the bed. So we don't have to get out of bed to turn those on and off. Oh, the other thing as well is we've got the cabling for the max fan. So that just runs in down along there. I put that in some conduit there where there's a bit of a 
sharp point that it could potentially wear through and that runs through. Now there's no switch for that. That's just gonna be hardwired into the fuse block. And that's because this has a switch on here and it's also got the remote as well. So we're not putting a separate switch on that. All right, so we're just gonna crack on with running some more of these cables at the moment. So we ended up using up that whole 100 metre roll of 12 volt cable. I've then gone and ordered some more of that and finished the majority of our 12 volt cabling. I think for most people, the 100 metres would be more than sufficient. I probably went a little overboard with the amount of circuits I was running. But yeah, we're gonna finish that up. At the moment, I'm just working out the position for our shore plug. So originally I ordered a 15 amp plug for this, which you can see has got a fatter earth. I then went and ordered a 10 amp. This has got the standard plug for Australia. So I think this is going to give us a bit more flexibility in terms of where we can charge. So if we're at you know, a friend's house or something, we can just plug in here. It is going to give us slightly less charge, but I think having the flexibility in this case is better for us. So I made this backing board out of some nine mil ply. And at the moment, I'm just working out the positioning of this. I'm trying to get it as far from the heater as I can, but there's also a bit of ribbing in there that's going to prevent us sliding it over any further. So I'm just working out where that position is on the inside. I'm just using the water heater as a bit of a reference point to where I'm going to put the shore plug. In, we're using the same 30 mil screws that we used to put the floor in. So that ended up being a little more challenging than we thought it was going to be, just getting it to seat down and lock into place nicely. So what we did was swapped out the um, first foam gasket that came with it for the thinner one, and then we also swapped out the 9 mil ply brace behind and just made a 15 mil one and then just backed off the top screws a little bit. I think it was pulling the top of it down tighter and not letting the lid close properly. But yeah, a little bit of fiddling and now it looks to be working pretty nicely. We've now run all of the 12 volt and 240 cables that we need. And the only thing left that we've got is a couple of cables for some remote switching and monitors and things like that. So that's our Renergy monitor and planning to put that on the bathroom wall. So that's got that cable that we're going to run up and over from where the shunt will be down where all the solar stuff is. Got an extension cord, so that's a 10 meter. It's just slightly longer than the one that came with it. But that's going to run from the inverter to the remote switch to turn the inverter on and off. And I'm going to put that on the wall on the side of the shower in the kitchen as well. Then I've got a video cable as well that we're going to run from the back of the van along the roof line and then down to the front ready for when we put a head unit in the front with a reverse cam. So that'll be our cable for the reverse cam. Well, that's a wrap on cabling. So we've run pretty much all of our 12 volt 240 cables and a few other remote and monitoring cables that we need before we start filling in the walls. There's a couple of things left to run, such as aerial cables. We're gonna put a CB radio in and probably a cell phone or mobile phone booster. So not 100% sure where we're putting those yet or where the cables are going, but yeah, everything else is in. So really exciting to see all that. It looks a bit chaotic at the moment, but I think once the cladding and all that goes on, it should look really neat and you won't see any of this. So yeah, thanks for watching.